Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about metallic bonding, metals and alloys. In this video, we'll start by focusing on the structure and bonding in metals and from there move into alloys and their structure. And we'll finish by taking a look at the properties of metals and of metal alloys. Chemical bonds are formed so atoms can achieve a full outer shell of electrons. This makes atoms more stable and therefore less reactive. In the periodic table, the elements of group zero are called the noble gases. That's this column on the right hand side here. These elements have a full outer shell of electrons, which makes them chemically inert. In other words, they are unreactive, and so they are chemically stable. The other atoms in the periodic table react and form chemical bonds until they have the same electronic structure as one of the noble gas elements. There are three different types of strong chemical bonds – ionic, covalent and metallic. For ionic bonding, the particles are oppositely charged ions and it occurs in compounds formed when metals are combined with non-metals. For covalent bonding, the particles are atoms which are sharing pairs of electrons, and it occurs in most non-metallic elements and in compounds made of non-metals. In metallic bonding, the particles are atoms which share delocalized electrons, and this type of bonding occurs in metallic elements and in alloys. In this video, we will be focusing on metallic bonding. When we're talking about metallic substances, we could be referring to metallic elements or to alloys. The majority of elements are metals, and you can see this from the periodic table that I'm showing here, where the metals have been highlighted in red. And metals are found to the left of the periodic table and towards the bottom. Substances made of metals consist of giant structures of atoms, and they're referred to as giant as they're made up of a huge number of atoms. And they are arranged in a regular pattern, and you can see that from this two-dimensional diagram that I'm showing here. There are clear layers, or you might call them rows. There is a lot of symmetry here. The atoms are all shown as being the same size with good consistent circles, and the atoms are densely packed together. In other words, they are very close together. And these aspects of the structure influence the properties of metals, allowing them to be bent and shaped easily. Normally, you draw a diagram of a metallic structure in two dimensions because it's easier and more clear. But it is worth noting that they are three-dimensional shapes, really, and their layered structure and their dense packing of atoms does continue into three dimensions, really. Most of the metals that we use in everyday objects are alloys, and an alloy is a mixture of two or more metals, or it can be a mixture of one metal with some non-metals mixed in. And the reason that we do this is once we get the mixture, the properties of the metal change. And so, for instance, pure metals might be more malleable or softer, and the alloys that we produce could be harder or more resistant to corrosion. And so scientists mix together the metals and they create an alloy that has got the properties that they want. To understand why pure metals have such different properties to the alloys that we can make from them, we need to look at the structure that they have. On the left hand side here, we've got pure metals and the pure metals you can see have only one type of atom. That's what we mean by pure. And as a result of this, these atoms of the metal are arranged in nice rows. And these rows are all very regular, and that's because all of the atoms are the same size. And so because these rows or layers are so regular, if you were to hit them with a hammer or press them, you can change their shape. And that's what malleable means. You can change their shape without breaking them or cracking them. 
and that's also what makes pure metals very soft. In contrast, for an alloy, you've got your original metal, but you've also got at least one other type of atom. And crucially, as you can see from my picture, this second atom is a different size. It's not always smaller, sometimes it can be a larger atom. But as a result of the atoms that are now present in this mixture all being different sizes, the layered structure has been distorted or disrupted. It's certainly no longer regular. And so as a result of that, there aren't really any layers, and so the atoms don't slide past each other as easily as in the pure metal. And this then means that they won't be so malleable, they will in fact be much harder than pure metals and be less easily shaped. And the precise proportions that you have for the alloy, in other words, how much of this extra element do we add compared to the original element, that will influence the properties that the alloy has got. For instance, the larger the proportion of this second element, the harder the alloy is likely to be, the less easily it will be shaped, and that would make it more suitable for a particular use. The electrons in the outer shell of metal atoms are delocalized. And this means that they are no longer in their shell, which is a relatively limited space for them to occupy. And this means that these electrons are free to move through the whole structure. And it's really important to describe their movement as moving through the whole structure rather than any alternative word for through. And you can see this from the two diagrams that I'm showing here. On the left hand side, I'm showing eight atoms of a metal and their outer electrons are shown as is their outer electron shell as a solid circle. On the right hand side, that outer shell has been removed because all of those outer shells are merging together and the electrons that were in them have now been delocalized, which means that they are free to move. And the metal atoms have lost a negative electron, and so technically now they are positively charged ions. These delocalized electrons are free to move through the structure, and so technically they could be anywhere in the metal. And so sometimes we actually don't show those electrons at all. An alternative way of showing the metal structure is what I'm now showing in the middle, where you can still see the positive metal atoms, the ions, and I have greyed out the area of the metal structure where those delocalized electrons could be. They could be anywhere in this space. And so that's why I'm not showing them in this middle diagram, because it, we don't actually know at any one time where those electrons will be. And so you need to be able to recognise both the middle diagram and the one on the right hand side where the delocalised electrons have been shown. The sharing of delocalised electrons gives rise to strong metallic bonds that holds the structure in place. And this metallic bonding is down to the electrostatic attraction between the positively charged metal ions and the negatively charged delocalized electrons. Because the positive ions would obviously repel each other, but they're held in place due to the strong attractions that they have for the many delocalized electrons that are moving through the structure, far more than one attraction at any one time. Particle theory can be used to help explain changes of state. The particles in a solid are held together in ordered rows and a regular pattern and the particles are not free to move around, only to vibrate about a fixed position. And this is because there are strong forces between the particles holding them in that fixed position. In order to turn a substance from a solid into a liquid, these forces need to be overcome or at least weakened and so energy needs to be put in for this to happen. And this energy is only supplied once a substance reaches its melting point. 
Once a substance has been turned from a solid into a liquid, there are still forces between those particles, but they are weaker than previously, which is why the particle arrangement for a liquid is much more disordered and more random than it is for a solid. Breaking these forces is necessary to convert a liquid into a gas because once a liquid has turned into a gas, those particles have actually got no forces between them. And that's why the gas particles are arranged entirely randomly and entirely separately and they're very disorganised. And the energy required to convert a liquid into a gas is supplied once a material reaches its boiling point. The amount of energy needed to change state from solid to liquid and liquid to gas will depend on the strength of the forces between the particles. And the type of substance itself, so that means its structure or its bonding, will affect the type of particle a substance is made up of. And so this could mean we're talking about molecules or we could be talking about ions in a lattice. And this will affect the type of force between the particles of that substance and the strength of these forces. A useful generalisation to keep in mind is that the stronger the forces between particles, the harder they will be to separate. And so the higher the melting and boiling points will be for that substance. Metallic substances are made up of giant structures of a huge number of atoms with strong metallic bonding. And this is due to the strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the positively charged metal ions and the negatively charged delocalized electrons. And you can see that on this diagram here. The metal atoms have lost electrons, so they're being shown as positively charged ions. And there are delocalized electrons spread through this structure. And I'm showing with the blue dashed lines the electrostatic forces of attraction that are present between the ion and the delocalized electrons. You can see that there are lots of attractions being shown here, which is what contributes to the strong metallic bonding in the structure. As a result of this, metals have high melting points and high boiling points. Since a large amount of energy is needed to overcome the electrostatic attractions, which constitute these strong metallic bonds and makes the particles in a metallic substance very difficult to separate. Electric current is the flow of charged particles. To conduct electricity, the charged particles must be free to move. So for a material to be a conductor of electricity, it needs to contain charged particles in its structure, and those charged particles must be free to move. Metals are good conductors of electricity because they have negatively charged delocalized electrons in their structure which are free to move through the metal and carry charge. So if we connected a circuit with a power supply and a bulb and connected it up as I'm showing here with a gap in the circuit and then we put a material into that gap to try to complete the circuit, we could prove whether the material was an electrical conductor or not. With a metal, the bulb would light up, since metals are electrical conductors. And so by placing the metal into the gap, we have completed the circuit and the electric current can flow. Metals are good conductors of electricity because the delocalized electrons can carry electrical charge through the metal. Don't forget that all important word, through. If we take a look at a zoomed in cross section of a metal, we can see the metal atoms that have lost electrons to form positive ions, as well as the delocalized electrons in the metal structure, which are free to move. When we turn on an external direct current, the electrons will all move through the structure in one direction. And this is because they are negatively charged, and so they will all be attracted and move towards the positive terminal. Remember, I'm only showing a small cross-section of a metal here. In one copper wire, there would be billions and billions of delocalized electrons. 
In addition to being good electrical conductors, metals are good conductors of thermal energy as well. And this is because thermal energy is transferred by the delocalized electrons. And this happens because when delocalized electrons in a metal absorb thermal energy, they gain kinetic energy and move faster. These faster moving electrons will collide with atoms and with other electrons, transferring this energy through these collisions. And this process allows thermal energy to spread quickly and efficiently through the metal, making it a good conductor of thermal energy. And you could do a simple safe experiment to prove this by taking a metal spoon and a wooden spoon and placing them both in a beaker of hot water. After a few minutes, if you measured the temperature of the metal spoon, you would notice a higher temperature for the metal than you would for the non-metal. Alternatively, you could take a metal and a non-metal and stick a paper clip to the end of both of them using some Vaseline. And then, if you provided the same amount of heat energy to the opposite end of both of these materials, gradually that heat would be conducted through the substance. And you could prove that the metal was the better conductor of thermal energy because the paperclip would fall off the end of the metal substance much faster than it would the non-metal. Okay, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.